This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us today. With us is co-host Richard Fields and John Cameron. I'm James Just. And gentlemen. James the Just. James the Just. That's what they say. Yeah. Uh, it turns out in the VP sweepstakes, uh, California's Camilla Harris is starting to lose out. She was the front runner a week ago, and now this week she's dropped off the top three from what I read yesterday. What do you guys think about that thing? Well, that's because people Good started better. Looking, that's because people started looking at her as a candidate and examining what she's done, and uh, everything she's done is horrible. Well, it's actually not that. I mean, uh, she's <clears throat> she's upset uh, Biden's inner circle. They're they're apparently really upset about the T-shirt moment uh, about busing that uh, federal that he that Biden. Um, objected to at the federal level and and she at the at one of the debates said uh uh there's this little eight-year-old girl blah 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 i was that girl and so uh, i think uh that uh, that his inner circle of his sister and his wife um have a real problem with that although they're acting all buddy buddy and everything else i mean i would think i'd rather have uh adolf hitler uh, than Kamala Harris. No, not that quite that bad, but man, she's a piece of work. So what the heck? Yeah. It seems to me that it's more about her, uh, lack of remorse for, for her shots at Biden than it is anything of her political career. I mean, if you look at Biden and Camilla Harris, you've got the architect and the enforcer of everything that's been wrong with police policy for the last 30 years. Yeah. And so why the heck they would want to choose those, that's those two as a, as the running team in this, time is beyond me but well from the from the standpoint of the uh, joe jorgensen campaign i think they i don't think they could pick a better person than kamala harris and joe biden hmm. i well, mean can you think of anybody that would be easier to run to or run against in an era of uh, uh a burgeoning police state with uh, her being in favor of uh, uh defending dirty cops her she is uh, uh unwilling to give a dna test to uh to uh, people who are on death row, uh, she, you know, ensuring their death. Uh, I mean, this is bad news all the way around. Laughing about uh, prosecuting uh, marijuana cases uh, and then at the same time saying, well, yeah, I inhaled uh, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. You know, she she is a, 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 a career poll uh, who got her start under the uh, infamous uh, Willie Brown uh, as uh, originally his girlfriend. And th th there's just nothing nothing to like about her. I yes. thought all the really Bones girlfriends were blonde. Um, I don't. I don't ever remem remember seeing them out and out and about in the city. Uh, I think we're using the term well, girlfriend yeah, politely. She, she was probably underage then, so because I, I doubt that, but yeah. <laughs> I think we're using the term girlfriend politely in this particular case. The you know it was a quid pro quo relationship. You know, you do me a favor and I'd do you one. It's it really was a. She doesn't have much ethics. I mean, she's put parents of children who were, you know, didn't go to school into jail because she somehow thinks that's going to make those kids go to school. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But, you know, she is the the embodiment of everything wrong with the police well, state. Who, who, are the, who are the three that remain? The top three. Oh, uh, Harris. Is Karen, is Karen Bass one of them? Karen Bass is one of them. Um, one of, one of a, a person who has uh, unapologetically uh, come out uh, in praise of Scientology. Yeah, yeah. And then you have Elizabeth Warren has come back into the top three again. She's been in yeah. and out of that top three so, so many times. She's a yo yo. And so what's, that, what's the name of the gal that's the, uh, the uh, she's in a wheelchair from having her, losing her legs? I mean, Tammy Duckworth. Yeah, yeah. Is she, is she then, in the top three? Uh, I, 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 I dropped out. The third one was Susan Rice. Susan Rice? Yeah. Darkware dropped out? No, wait, seriously. Susan Rice is in the top three? Yeah. That's what I that's what I read in the paper. Okay. Here. The person who said that, what was it, uh, in, in Libya, it was just uh, some people were mad about a tweet or something? I forget what, what, what she alleged. Movie, yeah, about a movie nobody saw. Yeah. That's... Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I mean, Trump is trying to do everything he can to be defeated. And now I'm convinced that the Biden campaign is doing exactly the same thing. Well, I think if they actually let Biden speak, 
uh, and if there is a debate, which I doubt there's going to be, if they actually let him speak, uh, you know they're going to feed him questions that that uh, he's memorized answers to, and he's not going to answer the questions given. What I'd love to see is is uh, Trump just turn to uh, Biden and engage him in conversation for about two minutes and watch. I, I'm, I'm I'm having trouble believing that he can that that Biden can actually remember a memorized answer. Well, I'm I'm a little worried about that too because if he's, you know, I don't know whether he's got Alzheimer's or whether it's vascular dementia or what what kind it is, but the ability to, especially short term memory, I mean, things that you knew a hundred years ago, you might still, well, no, in his case, only seventy seven years ago, you might uh, you might be able to remember, but new stuff, I mean, hell, I'm having trouble learning new stuff myself. So um, anyway, yeah, I think it's. It's it's uh, I'm just shocked that the American public is looking at these candidates and thinking that we only have two choices. Which one of these is the lesser evil and coming up with an answer where they can actually look themselves in the eye in the mirror the next day after voting for either one of them? I mean, it's it's horrible. And you know, the BBC said, uh, uh, you know, Biden's a terrible candidate. And if Trump hadn't done such a bad job, he wouldn't stand a chance against a, you know, a decent incumbent president. And um, that's BBC. So, you know, and they're, they're pro anything that's got a D in front of it. Um, Democrat, dumb, you know, whatever it might be. So. Yeah, well, it's gotten worse since the last time. Who would have thought that the election would actually be worse this time than four years ago? That's just, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if it, if it's, if it's worse. Cause I mean, it, it doesn't, this one doesn't have Hillary Clinton in it. Uh, so, yeah, but I'm not sure Biden is any different. It's still just a figurehead of the establishment. Speaking oh, yeah. of figureheads of the establishment, New York Times is saying that uh, they need to debunk election night decisions. That now, because of the mail-in voting, that we're not going to know who elected president on election night anymore. Which, of course, in California, we know this because it takes weeks to decide with what the election results actually are. Yeah, I mean, uh, this was one of the few things I think Trump has right which is that mail-in voting uh, is subject to fraud. I mean, uh, there's already rumors going around that people are uh, paying uh, non-voters for the uh, use of their mailbox, so, so to speak. Uh, I, I, I can't see any way in the world how mail-in voting can be uh, thought of as uh, not subject to fraud. That's not to say that uh, it necessarily is going to happen, but I would be surprised if it, if it, if it didn't. Uh, yeah, Richard, your your image on, from 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 here is is pretty uh, bad. Are you seeing him okay, James? Uh, he's pixelated, but we can hear him fine. We know uh, what he looks like. You know, yeah, that's true. I just you know, like to, I just like all of Richard to shine through. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, no, and, and you know, it's it's a it, you know it's it's a serious problem. Uh, and and but of course, what the New York Times is doing also is they're taking a pot shot at their biggest competition, which is network and cable TV. They're saying that all of the hot shots and, and media pundits that uh, hold forth on election night and say, our computers say, are projecting uh, uh, such and such win uh, because X number of precincts have been counted and so forth and so on, that, that, that you know, that that's, that's flawed. And that's uh, New York Times uh, saying, well, you know, our uh, stolid uh, reporting of the actual facts months after the election, well, weeks after the election takes place, that's what you can trust, not these TV pundits. Well, I remember Richard Richard and I, were, were, we were sitting in a bar celebrating the libertarian victory. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. And and the, the one, uh, not poll, the New York Times is the one we were watching. They had a meter up on their website. Uh, or, yeah, I think it was the New York Times, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they, they do that. On their website that indicated the likelihood of the winner. And, and that was the one we were watching. And it went from, from um, you know, it was like 90% in favor of Clinton. And, uh, uh, and then it dropped to like 80% and then 70 and then 60. And we're looking at it going, huh? And then 50. And then it swung over to likelihood of Trump. So they're basically chiding people for doing exactly what they were doing on the last election night. Well, to be fair to the gray lady, they're saying that they, they pointed out that their their arrow, their uh, indicator uh, is part of the flawed 
reporting of uh, election counting that will be drawn into weeks, if not months. Mm. Uh, and of course, it raises a larger, uh, another, a couple of other issues too. Why in the world does it take so long for the vote counters at local precincts to open the mail? Uh, and I, I, I guess the answer to that, one answer to that is that, I don't know, in, in some areas, it's, I'm sure it's the postmark that counts, not the, uh, not the date received. I mean, that would be, that's probably where it is most of the time, which means, which automatically drags things out for a couple, three or four days, probably longer given the uh, uh, lessening amount of competence on the part of the uh, post office. Well, and I, I think another thing is it takes them that long to change that many votes. <laughs> and you also, you have to, you have to verify each vote, they verify each ballot, and then they have to count them. And then they have to make sure, you know, they can't be, resorted back to be tracked and so they've got these whole stages through rather than what we used to we go to you'd vote you'd stick it in a box the machine would count it and you'd walk away uh, that's it used to be done and now we've got these all the steps there was someone in my district here uh, last last year who had his initially had his vote rejected then he called and said oh well no so they rejected oh no you're fine and so, so how many times now you have to check your ballot to make sure it was accepted and so this whole count in ballot thing is absurd it took what, six weeks before they told me that my elect that I had won finished second place in a two person race. <laughs> well, what? Yeah. It took six yeah. weeks for them to well, tell us well, 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 <laughs> with a with a, a respectable margin, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, they, they, it was a two person race. You know, he had thirty thousand votes or whatever. I had one hundred and nineteen, but you know, it doesn't matter. It's a two person race. He had two. I had one. Hey, there you go. It's there, it shouldn't take six weeks in something that simple, but. So I got a question: Is there going to be no in-person voting? Is it is it all by mail this election? I, I don't mean, think that's been decided yet. No, I, 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 I think that would be a that would be a state by state, if not locality by locality decision. I think hmm. in California they said there's going to be a handful of in-person place voting, so people can go and vote in place. But most of it, you're going to get your ballot by mail already. Huh. I think they've already decided. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think Newsom decided that. I wonder. I wonder what. Uh, what percentage of proven fraud it would take for a court? Well, obviously, it wouldn't be in California. The ninth, the ninth circuit wouldn't. You know, they wouldn't because we know what California is going to do. They're going to vote uh, Democrat. But uh, what if you're in in a swing state and um, and somebody decides to really go after the the uh, the counting process or the collating process or whatever and proves some measure of fraud. I mean, what would you have to do? What would that level have to be to just throw the vote out and say you got to do a revote? Because you're right, Richard. I think Richard made a, a wonderful point at the beginning. Mail-in, I mean, we know that there's way more voter fraud, especially in California, than they say there is because um, they don't demand any kind of ID or anything else. And even if you demanded an ID, you could still get around that. You buy a pretty decent ID for 50 bucks. But um, so voter, like you said, just uh, uh, create a straw address and, and vote as many times as you want. So um, it's, this is going to be interesting as hell. It really is. Well, we've already had cases in, I forget where, that someone disqualified 200 ballots because, you know, they can. An election worker decided to disqualify 200 ballots just because she could. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't even matter. I think, and I think a Republican got caught ballot stuffing the old way, voting for as many ballots as he can. So it's, it goes both parties. It's oh not, yeah, no, I'm, I know it's, I'm, it's I'm human not either one of, and uh, either one of the two parties that are that are allowed to actually run campaigns. Uh, there are other parties, but you know the the two parties that are exactly the same but pretend to be different. Um, you know. I mean, they're both so bad. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm sort of coming around to Richard's thinking that they're both so bad. It doesn't matter which one's in. So I, I don't know of those two. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just become all call it convoluted, right? We've got, it takes months to count votes and we're got, not going to know who, who the election somehow for the, in the past 50 years, we could count votes in one night and now we can't despite the fact that information moves faster and cheaper than it's ever moved before. It's just, <laughs> we're going backwards, gentlemen. We're going backwards. I don't understand how, but we're going backwards. 
Um, speaking of going backwards, Berlin had a huge protest this weekend about uh, anti-lockdown protests. Apparently, there's tens of thousands of people flooded the streets saying that masks make them slaves and all the various chants that people make about the, the man. Yeah, they, they don't man. muzzle us. Don't yeah. muzzle us. Yeah. Well, there was, yeah, there's a whole chunk of, of slogans. But the point is, is that it's the mandate I think people are actually upset about more than you know, the fact that you're asking people to, you know, hey, take care, be cautious. It's like, hey, we're going to mandate you have to wear this piece of cloth. And I think Germans are extra sensitive to that. Maybe than we are. Yeah, and my understanding is that Germany is, I'm not sure, is Germany one of the worst as far as lockdown is concerned? I thought perhaps they were not. I, I don't really know. Uh, but in, in any case, I, I mean, you can make a really good libertarian case for saying people should wear masks to protect other people. Uh, it's, you know, it's not my right uh, as a contagion carrier to infect you. That's, that's you know, pretty, uh, a pretty good example of doing harm to others. On the other hand, uh, if I'm uh, walking in an open field uh, with nobody else around or driving my car with nobody else in it, why should I wear a mask? Why should that be uh, mandated? Which it is, and people are being uh, cited for it across the country, that kind of thing. Uh, or swimming in the ocean with, with nobody within, within sight. Uh, these are the kinds of things that people are saying, hey, wait a minute, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. What does make sense is for people who are at risk, the elderly, uh, the people with comorbidities, et cetera, to wear masks or self-isolate or both, and for people who are in contact with the more at risk to be, uh, to be uh, mindful and careful. Uh, but a, a, a society-wide, uh, civilization-wide lockdown, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's We're, we're oh, killing more people uh, through suicide and drug abuse and all the rest than we are uh, possibly, can possibly be saving and, uh, and, uh, and, as, as far as uh, the uh, coronavirus is concerned. Can I add to that? Um, the the And I think it might have been the gray lady, all I call her a gray something else, um, reported that a hundred million more people because of the economic um, fallout of the lockdowns and everything have been pushed into the worst kind of poverty um, by um, this, this meltdown that we've got. And we know that that level of poverty kills a very high percentage of people in it annually. So if you pushed another hundred million into the worst kind of poverty, probably 10 million of them are going to be dead by the end of the year. So, you know, right there, you've got, you've got, what is that? How many, what is the total deaths worldwide from this thing? 500,000? So you've got 20 times, 20 times those deaths from the, from the economic fallout of it. And you add in what Richard was talking about, the, the, you know, the, Love spousal abuse is crazy off the charts. The emotional scarring of children, the lack of economic development. A, a doctor that was on, on uh, I think a Fox News program of all things said that 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 you know kids need to be back in school for the emotional part and for nutritional part because the way we we have this school set up, a lot of the these very very poor children in our country are getting their best meal their best meal at breakfast at the school and at lunch at the school. And this is in the U.S. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is the, the trade yeah, if you look at country, If you look at countries like India, which has stranded uh, a, a, a huge proportion of their poorest population far from home and far from any uh, possible uh, medical care, they have essentially sentenced their poorest to uh, a, uh, a very a very painful death in many cases. Uh, and that's in, in the hundreds of millions. I mean, uh, you know, the whole idea that we can listen to a, a passel of so-called scientists at the World Health Organization uh, pontificate from on high and tell us this is the science, this is the only thing that makes sense. It might make sense on an individual basis to say wear a mask, mm -hmm. socially distance. It does not make sense to give that kind of advice and mass, and that's what's happening, and that's what Germany's Germans are protesting against, and to the extent Americans are protesting, that's what they're protesting against. Yeah, one well, in Sweden and Germany, you've already proved, even though they have a much lower transmission rate than we currently have in our spike, um, that kids can go back to school and do it quite safely, and the incidences of, of disease and transmission are minuscule. I think in Germany, it was like 0.05 percent. 
Um, and um, so, you know, we're keeping kids out of school in this country and for what reason? And a lot of large organizations are making long-term decisions about uh, as if the world is going to live with, with, uh, with COVID for years to come about staffing levels, about maintaining uh, social distancing, which I would rather much rather we call physical distancing uh, in their offices for years to come. So half of their workforce working from home and, you know, the, the economic, you know, people forget that, that, that economics translates into, into life and death. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're all such, such fans of capitalism, because it's been proven, never disproven, proven over and over and over again. Yeah, that, and this, this, this whole thing is, a, is a, a perfect vehicle for those in government who would like to see us fear each other more than they fear government. Yeah. yeah, well, they tell us to follow science, but they seem to forget that there's more than one type of science. There's psychological science, there's economic science, there's a wide variety of sciences. And if the all they want to put in is, is this one narrow view of healthcare science, well, that's fine, but you've forgotten all the other things and all the, the unintended consequences of these decisions. And if you don't even bother to think them through, like they didn't even bother to think through, okay, if we have a mask mandate, what kind of pushback are we going to get? Are the mandates actually going to create more resistance than, than we get now if we just ask people to, to carry them. And that's what we're actually seeing is we're seeing that the mandates are actually creating resistance to the policies that they actually need people to do, mm -hmm. that they want people to do. And it's, it's, it's become dumb and it's not even effective because as we see here in our next story is the COVID cases are up around the world. There's a spike, not just here in the United States, the Europe and all these places who had lockdowns are seeing a spike oddly enough, except for Sweden and oh, what is it? Thailand, the other place that didn't have... I forget there was another place that didn't have lockdowns and they aren't seeing a spike. They're actually seeing the decline to almost nothing. Mm. Well, yeah, I think probably you can say that the uh, people who are most at risk in those countries got it early. Therefore they got through the top of the bell curve uh, sooner than countries with uh, the more stringent uh, lockdown standards. Mm. Well, and the other thing is, I don't know about the health of, Sweden is one of the healthiest countries in the world. Again, the same doc on, on a thing I watched on, on Fox said they, they don't have the huge incidence of childhood obesity that we have here um, or, you know, obesity in general. There's a much lower incidence of diabetes. It's a relatively home. She didn't say it, but it's a, it's a homogeneous population. We have, you know, a, a heterogeneous population here with, with a number of, of, uh, demographic groups that, that just have horrible health statistics. I mean, obesity is rampant, diabetes is rampant, uh, uh, habits that are, are, you know, actually push people into comorbidity phase or widespread. So uh, there are some reasons why uh, Sweden, I don't know about Thailand, but at least Sweden uh, is a success story. And um, yeah, I think Sweden's I, death rate is relatively average, but they're but they didn't do any of this draconian stuff. Now they have like Norway right next door who has did actually did a lot better, but then you have to go, how is Norway counting? And again, it's, I saw that obesity is the single biggest factor. So you get to States like United States where we're all kind of fat and you get places like, you know, in China or, or Norway where they're, they don't have a obese problem, obesity problem. Those places they've survived this quite well. And you've got, so there's other factors that we're not even actually considering, which is part of the problem. It's just just sit down, shut up, and listen to the person at the front of the room. Do what they tell you. And, and again, we, we don't know. They're counting. They're not saying, uh, well, maybe they are. They're saying people are dying uh, with COVID. They're not, they're, they're mm -hmm. not saying dying of COVID. They're dying with mm -hmm. COVID. What I'd like How to convenient. see. How convenient. What, uh, what I'd like to see though. number, I'd like to see the number that isolates out the, those people that were actually killed by the virus, dying of. And in, in, in the case of the virus, basically it's, it's a SARS-like thing. It's sudden acute respiratory syndrome, which is killing people, which is what killed with SARS. But with SARS, they counted the cases of people who died from SARS, not who died with SARS. So if you isolated that out, anyway, well, I think we're beating a dead horse, so we probably should move on to something else. Yeah, well, we saw it with, with Herman Cain, right? We saw exactly what you're talking about. He actually had a 14-year battle with cancer, and then he, he died from COVID, when it was really, it was the fact that he was not a healthy person to begin with, so any severe illness could have actually killed him. And it just so happened to have been COVID. Now, it's tragic. Every death, 
every single death is tragic, right? No one should be dying because you get to have a, a simple sickness or something. But, you know, these are natural dangers of life, right? Mm -hmm. You can't you can't walk around life without dangers. We, we all accept them. And at some point we have to gonna decide is COVID, you know, a net, a, one of those dangers that we accept like the flu or any of the other things. Is yeah. It, well, we accept the fact that, you know, I don't know how many thousand people are gonna die because we like to drive our cars. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, over the course of 10 years, more people are gonna die from the fact that we like to drive our cars than from, at least in this country, than from than dying with COVID, not of COVID. So, but we still drive our cars. We put on seatbelts. Now they mandate seatbelt laws and they all have airbags. So we've learned how to make that vehicle much, much safer. Yeah. And you know, let's let's figure out a way to have this this vehicle be a little bit safer, you know, and and, uh, and then just go live our lives. I feel I feel horribly sorry for for kids on the one hand you know, this has been horrible for their education, their life, and their planning. On the other hand, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity for them to understand that an external force can completely, that nobody's prepared for, can completely turn their lives upside down. And I think learning that early is a very valuable lesson. Oh, well, let's switch to something that's a good lesson. Um, SpaceX flashed down their, their uh, first human uh, occupants. Right, they launched a couple of humans into space, sent them to the space station for two months, and then they just had their space capsules successfully splashed down and recover. So, and they did it for like a what a tenth of the cost that NASA said they could do it. Is what they? I'd, I'd be shocked if it was that much. It was probably five percent. Yeah, yeah NASA. What's interesting to me is that uh, is that uh, NASA is finally after what forty or fifty years actually cooperating with private. Uh, entities in the exploration of space, and I think I, I think we need to congratulate NASA on finally coming around, and obviously congratulate these space companies for uh, doing the commercialization of space. It would never happen if it, if we left uh, all of uh, the space efforts up to uh, to government. No, they're too yeah. risk averse at this stage. The bureaucracy is too risk averse for government to do these kinds of things. They're never going to go to the to the Mars with send humans to Mars. NASA wouldn't do it. If something went wrong, they'd be too afraid. You need someone with some uh, cojones, shall we say, in order to take the risk. Mm -hmm. And that's simply not people who work in government are risk averse by their very nature. People who work in the government bureaucracy. That's why you work in the government bureaucracy rather than. Well, they, they also lie. They lie about risk because the actual risk of every space shuttle launch ending in death was one out of 84. But NASA published the risk as being one out of over 2000. So, you know, the other, the, but you got to figure NASA as an organization is basically designed as welfare for PhDs. So, you know, that they're, they're not going to produce wonderful stuff. Maybe back in the day where they were brave and didn't care and all the rest of that, but not anymore. All right, John, we got to end on that. Thank you guys for, for appearing today. Thank you everybody for watching. You can catch us on libertariancounterpoint.com and on YouTube, and you can find us on access sacramento channel 17 what is it richard eight o'clock thursday eight thursday noon friday 4 a.m on saturday my favorite time this is gail morgan thanking you for watching the libertarian counterpoint each thursday at 8 p.m channel 17 on comcast on youtube and on facebook we invite you to come again next week for the libertarian counterpoint